You're looking at Rocky Point Park in Rhode Island. It looks like a big field today, but back in the day, well, let me just show you. Drop in the TV. Rocky Point Amusement Park is straight up legendary in Rhode Island history for so many reasons. It was the place to be every summer. Rides, games, concerts, the largest shore dinner hall in the world. It had everything you could want. Rhode Islanders love this place, but it closed for good in 1996, and almost 30 years later, we still never stop talking about it. Today, Rocky Point has mostly returned to nature, and it's hard to imagine a loud, bustling amusement park once stood right here. It's wild seeing it like this. Considering Rocky Point once hosted famous bands, a president, generations of visitors, and most importantly, me in 1994. Thanks for the photos, mom. Especially this one, where I'm crying not because we had to leave, but because the flume got me wet and I didn't want to be wet. Also, with Rocky Point Park being on the list of abandoned Rhode Island icons, it continues the tradition of most places from my childhood being abandoned, like my middle school, the largest on the east coast of America, or the baseball stadium I went to every summer to watch the Pawtucket Red Sox. And even another amusement park from my childhood, the Enchanted Forest. But today, we're talking about a place near and dear to everyone in Rhode Island. A place whose history stretches from the 1840s all the way to 1996, with a lot happening in between. Welcome to the abandoned Rocky Point Amusement Park. Let me start with some rules of Rhode Island before we jump into the history. One, saying something bad about Rocky Point Park is actually considered treason in this state. Two, literally everyone who lives in Rhode Island has a story about Rocky Point. Everyone. Three, no matter what happens to this site in the future, it will always be where Rocky Point Amusement Park used to be. Let's have a moment of silence for our other fallen icons. All right, great. Now let's hop into my time machine, which for this journey is a plate of clam cakes. It'll make sense later, okay? Come with your family, come with your friends. Let's go. 1847, that's when Captain William Winslow, part owner of a steamboat, purchased 89 acres here after landing Sunday excursions on the shores and seeing its potential as a tourist destination. Within a few years, Winslow's Rocky Point became the most popular shore resort on the bay. In 1862, Captain Winslow sold it to Byron Sprague, who developed it into an expensive resort. He built a private mansion, a 10-story observation tower, and a hotel of 300 rooms. But financial struggles forced Sprague to sell the land in 1869 to the American Steamboat Company, who opened Rocky Point back up to the public and introduced a bunch of attractions, including a shooting gallery, stages for musical acts, trapeze artists, and performing animals. Then in 1877, Rocky Point secured its place in history. President Rutherford B. Hayes visited the park and made the first presidential telephone call to Alexander Graham Bell, who was stationed 13 miles away in Providence. I'll need you to speak a little more slowly. Yeah, those were the first words spoken by a president into a telephone, but you know they talked about how white chowder is the best chowder, which it is, and that's a fact. In 1884, the Continental Steamboat Company took ownership of Rocky Point, and master showman Randall A. Harrington led the parties here. By this time, Rocky Point stopped functioning as a resort after a massive fire burned down the hotel in 1883. In order to expand, Harrington built a scenic railway, added a carousel, and built a new shore dinner hall on pilings over the bay. Which brings us to one of the most heralded events in New England, the Rocky Point Clam Dinner. These dinners were so popular that over a thousand bushels of clams a day were consumed. These dinners were huge, both with the amount of people eating together and the amount of food. The dinners at Rocky Point would continue to be the stuff of legend. In the early 1900s, the park expanded under Harrington's leadership. One of the rides he added was the Circle Swing, a popular attraction for parks at the time. It'd rotate and swing visitors around at 100 miles an hour. No, I'm just kidding. Part of this ride is actually still at the park today, currently looking like an oil drilling rig. 
The circle swing was in operation until 1920, but this tower continued to be used for swinging rides until 1965. Another relic of the time sits atop the hill here, this big round stone structure that many people believed was the foundation of Sprague's massive tower. But its real purpose is much more practical. You're looking at the old Rocky Point water tank, which supplied the park with water until they began piping in city water. Mystery solved. Back to 1913 now, when advertising brochures pointed out, Rocky Point is a park of 89 acres with attractions at every turn, so tremendous in extent that with the throng of 75,000 people on the grounds, there is still room for many thousands more. And thanks to the electrified Warwick Railroad line and a trolley service, people from all over could more easily travel to the park, increasing attendance and making this the place to be in the summer. It wasn't just clam bakes and carny games though. Rocky Point also made a mark in the realm of baseball, hosting games in defiance of blue laws, which forbade or regulated entertainment and commercial activities on Sundays or religious holidays. Randall Harrington was kind of a bad boy, huh? Abe Ruth, the legendary baseball player, played two games at the park in 1914 for the Providence Grays. In the second game, he hit a triple that bounced into the ocean, and I like to think he chugged a huge gansett immediately after. Through the early 1900s, Rocky Point continued to be hot, attracting thousands of visitors until 1938, the last time the park would look like this. Specifically, the hurricane of 1938. The Category 3 storm ripped through Rhode Island without any advanced warning, since that technology didn't exist at the time. It remains the most powerful and deadliest hurricane in recorded New England history, with winds reaching 132 miles an hour. As for Rocky Point, the Providence Journal reported that it fell like a house of cards before the Southeast Fury. The oldest and most famous shore resort of the state was no more. The dinner hall was destroyed, the midway wrecked, and the gigantic wooden coaster, the Wildcat, was reduced to splinters. That's not the craziest part though. The year before, someone tampered with the monkey cage on the midway and 11 broke free. Some were captured, but the rest lived in the surrounding woods of Warwick, which is where they were when the hurricane hit. Locals grew to know and actually befriend the loose monkeys and were relieved when they learned that while the park was destroyed in the hurricane, the monkeys? Oh, the monkeys survived. For a while, it seemed that Rhode Island's oldest and largest amusement park had reached the end, as the entire area began to stagger back from the effects of the storm. This aerial image from 1939 shows the wrecked coastline and the remains of some of the buildings. Due to restrictions placed upon them by World War II, the park wasn't reopened to any great extent until June 1948. This grand reopening was lit. Massive fanfare, crowds, and traffic jams backing up into the nearby towns. Over 35,000 patrons swarmed into the park. Damn, Rocky Point was back. This grand reopening was thanks to new owners Vincent Furla and his brother Conrad, aka Mr. Rocky Point. Conrad is really the hero of this story, managing the park from 1949 to 1986. He was the person that everyone associated with the park, being pretty much everywhere throughout the day, zipping through the park on his motorbike, checking rides on the midway, and even picking up trash. Conrad is the guy behind the scenes of a ton of memories from this era of Rocky Point. In 1954, Hurricane Carol ripped through the state, once again causing extensive damage to Rocky Point Park, including the Ferris wheel breaking loose from its frame, and the iconic shore dinner hall being destroyed. But did that stop the furloughs from continuing on? Nope. A new shore dinner hall was built, the fourth one, that I'm sure you all remember, billed as the world's largest. And the party continued in Rhode Island, with visitors indulging in the Rocky Point clam dinner, then hitting up the rides after. The Skyliner taking people airborne, the Wildcat roller coaster, the Enterprise whipping people at a hundred miles an hour. Just kidding again. Or am I? The legendary House of Horrors complete with torture chamber. Personally, I didn't get to enjoy these things because my time was spent in Kitty Land on rides like the Antique Cars or taking a train ride on the Rocky Point Express, whose abandoned remains still wind through the woods here. 
This train would take you around the front of the park and even under some of the rides, giving you views of all the magic here. With Rhode Island being the smallest state, all of this was like having an amusement park in our backyard, because that's exactly what we had. You want to get tossed around on a coaster? Do you want to get so scared you cry like I did? Then enter the House of Horrors. Want to get spun around like five different ways? You want to go ride a giant thing called the spider? Or maybe you do want to get wet. Sure, just hop on the Ripta to Rhode Island's backyard. And I know it's basically a giant field today, but there are still more abandoned reminders of what used to be here. For example, the giant saltwater pool, which there were two versions of. The original hosted the 1936 Olympic trials and was destroyed in the hurricane of 1938. It was rebuilt bigger and better in 1949 and was a hit at the park. Often filled with patrons who could just visit without having to even go into the park. Sadly, it was filled in with concrete in the 1980s after declining use and expensive upkeep. Another relic here are the remains of the Skyliner in operation from 1966 until 1995. It was a gondola ride that would take visitors to the top of the park and back down, offering a view of everything Rocky Point had to offer. I actually do remember riding this back in 94. Here's a photo my dad got of my mom and sister on the gondola behind us. Today, the supports remain solitary in the field, along with the section that once powered the whole thing at the very top of the hill. Probably the most distinct feature of the park still left over from its heyday is the giant arch overlooking the ocean. Standing at 60 feet tall, the arch is actually one of 11 General Foods Peace Through Understanding archways that were constructed for the 1964 New York World's Fair. Their purpose was to act as a rendezvous point where families and groups could meet up. It was installed at Rocky Point in 1966 and has remained here ever since. Let's talk about the layout of the park now, and I mean the final layout before it closed down for good in 1996. This is the version of the park most of us remember. You're looking at a guide for visitors that was published in the mid-1980s. Besides smaller details like exactly what rides were in Kittyland, the biggest ride missing here is the Freefall, installed in 1988, which would drop riders 60 feet in less than 2 seconds. Otherwise, this is the last version of Rocky Point we all went to. There was the Palladium, hosting famous bands like Janis Joplin, ACDC, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and Pixies, and an appearance by President George Bush in 1990. And I just have to say that I'm pleased to uh, visit the Rocky Point Palladium. <laughs> hey, listen. This is the first time I've been to an amusement park in years. Next door was the smaller venue Windjammer, which would host events and banquets year-round. Yes, you could even get married at Rocky Point. Over here was the Flume, a huge water ride opened in 1971 that got me wet when I didn't want to be wet. There was the Music Express, a colorful rock and roll ride that would spin passengers around the track at 12 revolutions per minute. But probably the most well-known ride at Rocky Point was the Corkscrew, a gigantic roller coaster featuring a full 360 loop and two corkscrews. This thing was sick, and the hype was real. A legit coaster in Rhode Island? Hell yeah. Corkscrew was installed for the 1984 park season and was built from scratch for Rocky Point because of the addition of a 360 loop to the original corkscrew design. It became an icon of the park, appearing ominously in the background wherever you were. The corkscrew was a hit, and Rocky Point continued to bring in the crowds.
Okay, if Rocky Point was so huge, then why does it look like this today? Many reports point to the growth of car ownership and highway development, which meant people could travel and find entertainment over a much wider area. Cheap air travel also made it easy for families to visit Disney World and other mega parks. In many cases, these older amusement parks became old fashioned and out of date. Despite their charm, they just couldn't compete with the size and budgets of places like Disneyland, Universal, or Six Flags. But that wasn't really what happened with Rocky Point, because it was still pulling in the crowds. So what happened? In May of 1990, the failing Bank of New England demanded payment of nearly $5 million in mortgages that Rocky Point's owners had taken out on the park and several unrelated businesses. Money that wasn't owed yet and that the owners didn't have on hand. The official bankruptcy filing states, Scrambling to obtain other financing in 1991, the owners of Rocky Point quickly entered into a lending relationship with Fairway Capital Corporation, where Fairway loaned Rocky Point $5.3 million at 15.5% interest per year over 20 years, but with a balloon payment due in five years. Under this new loan, Rocky Point was required to pay interest of approximately $900,000 per year, and to accomplish this, it would have to save $50,000 per week during the operating season. Damn, they'd have to sell like a million clam cakes to break even, which they didn't. The next five years were described, appropriately, as a roller coaster ride, as the owners of the park struggled to generate the income needed to keep the park running. In October of 1995, a reorganization plan was approved by a federal judge who authorized a restructuring of the debt. The plan allowed the owners to either operate the park on a razor-thin budget or liquidate it and sell off the park's assets. Viewing the business as non-viable, the owners chose the second option. On two sad and rainy days for Rocky Point, the auction of the assets went ahead on April 16th and 17th, 1996. Everything was listed for sale. Rides, props, signs, everything that was a part of our memories of the park was offered to the highest bidder. Piece by piece, Rocky Point was dismantled and the larger rides found new homes across the world. However, the park did reopen for the 1996 summer season under new owners as the Rocky Point Family Fair. It was kind of a test run to see if the property was worth saving as a seasonal fairground, but the turnout wasn't enough to continue the idea into future seasons and Rocky Point as an amusement park closed forever. In the years that followed, the park was left abandoned on the coastline, with the remaining buildings, including the legendary Shore Dinner Hall, left to rot. A series of fires, vandalism, and the dangers posed by having these structures accessible led the city of Warwick to demolish everything left over. As we know it is gone, I do think there's a happy ending here. The city of Warwick later reclaimed the shoreline, turning it into a state park in 2014, providing a renewed space for locals and visitors to enjoy. Yeah, it might not be the grand amusement park we all remember, but it's also not a gated community, housing development, or commercial space. It's gone back to how William Winslow saw it back in the 1800s, a peaceful spot along the shores of Rhode Island. We can still enjoy it, just in a different way. And even if Rocky Point Amusement Park never comes back, we still have all of those memories through all of those decades. And we can still all agree that white chowder is the best chowder. 
Thank you, David Betancourt, for his work on You Must Be This Tall, the story of Rocky Point, an amazing documentary that was a wealth of information, along with the accompanying book. Thank you, Paul Sitko, for sending me photos that I cannot find anywhere online or in the archives. And thank you, George Lacrosse, for his in-depth coverage of everything Rocky Point on his website and Facebook group, Rocky Point Remembered. And thank you to everyone else who shared memories, photos, and videos of Rocky Point over the years. To see more interesting Rhode Island icons like this and learn about their history, you can check out the rest of my Abandoned From Above series on my YouTube channel right now. Thank you very much for watching.